Next presentation will be given by Rick van der Sede. And Rick is project manager in the NPEC, the Netherlands Plant Eco Phenotyping Center. And he is senior scientist, business developer for phenomics and automation at Wageningen University and research. And together with René Klein Langhorst, who is also here, um, he is the, um, a member of the NPEC building team and also a member of the IPPS planning team. Uh, we will enjoy in September. So the floor is yours. So. Yeah, so thank you, Thomas. It's really uh, nice to be here, actually. The impressive facilities they have here. Unfortunately, quite a few are online, but I hope you got a good impression. Um, I would like to talk about digital twins specifically. So we have been uh, working on a concept that we call the virtual tomato crop. And I'm going to slowly talk towards the applied end user. Those are the tomato growers in the Netherlands. So keep that in mind that we are working towards actually their needs and their ideas. So that's why I brought a picture of a huge tomato crop as they grow in uh, high-tech greenhouses all around the world, but they developed in the Netherlands. So I'm Rick van der Zellen, as uh, already Thomas uh, told you. Um, I'm also in the IPPN board. So I'm really happy to see that this working group is uh, organizing this session actually. Thanks for that. I have a background in AI and I hope to inspire you today. So if you have new ideas, let me know. Okay, let's uh, directly deep dive into the concept. So we are developing a, an idea actually. It's basically an idea around a digital twin where we say, okay, a digital twin has a real part and a virtual part. Uh, this is uh, the scheme actually to explain also what I'm going to talk about in my slides. So we have a real tomato crop growing, which requires phenotyping tools. So that's where all the tools that uh, were presented in earlier slides also come in. So you have sensors, you have different genotypes, they grow and you would like to know how are those plants growing actually. Then you generate data. I'll use the mouse pointer for also for the online. And, and you would like to actually make sense of that data. So you never be able to measure all your plants, especially when you are a tomato grower. So you would like to use models. And that's where the virtual actually plant comes in, the virtual tomato crop. And there we rely actually on another community also within our university that has been working on models for decades, you could say. So they have greenhouse models that predict the amount of light that is entering a certain uh, greenhouse design, taking into account the location of that greenhouse, taking into account the uh, amount of light over the seasons. And there we also have crop models, plant models, that also take into account the genotype, the environment, but also management decisions that are made by growers. And then the whole concept is actually that if we loop this virtual plant model, to the real plant model, we can also assist our growers with models. So they can do things in the virtual domain and they would see what would happen in the real domain without actually doing it on their real plants. So it requires control, decision support, and maybe even genotype selection. So just if I would go back 10 years, I'd say, if we would like to measure plants, um, I have seen many of our PhD students working on such a trial. So they have a table filled with plants and they need to know the biomass, plant height, number of leaves, all kinds of traits. And what's actually what was shocking, if I was uh, running around in a facility, I saw them doing this. But actually, if I run around today, I will still find a lot of people doing this. We saw all kinds of fancy tools today and yesterday, but I think the majority of our plant science community is still relying on hard work, manual work. So those tools are not available for everybody. You can show it time, so I think there's a microphone open. Yeah. But what would happen if you would have like 
a lot of plans. So all the experiments that are done by our PhD students are often limited in size because they don't have the manpower, the capacity to go through large numbers of plants, but actually gen genetics demand to go to higher numbers of plants. So this is actually exactly the reasoning that we used to apply for our phenotyping center. So we said we have an enormous amount of brains. They are spending too much time on manual work. They need tools. So since 2018, so Renee and I, it's also Renee is in the room, Renee klein Lankos. We've been working hard with a team actually to first get our facility on the roadmap. It's a national roadmap. If you are on the roadmap, you can apply for big money. Then we applied for the money and we got the money in 2018. And we together with the Utrecht University, we have been starting building our phenotyping center. And the good news for you is we are having an open access policy. So anybody interested could come over and make use of our tools. I will not show all the different elements of NPEC, but just to give you an overview, we also have field equipment, but we have ecotrons, we have highly controlled climate rooms, uh, we have greenhouse, and I will zoom in on module number five, specifically the greenhouse. If you would like to see this, you need to come over to the Netherlands in September in Wageningen for the IPVS. So the greenhouse specifically, there, um, I'm very fond of these artist impressions. So we have many of them. I think some of you have seen them before. It's a small greenhouse, 1,000 square meter. It has actually two zones, you could say. One is plants that move on conveyors. And the other one is actually plants on tables where sensors move to plants. And again here, I will not go into a full overview of what we have. I'm gonna zoom into the conveyor system because there, we have run our virtual tomato crop experiment. Just to keep on talking about digital twins, actually. Actually, this is how it looks like. So we have tomatoes growing in a compartment. Um, it's a modern greenhouse. So we have all kinds of uh, control uh, levels. So air is coming in through those white tubes and they are sucked out again through the blue tubes over there. So it's a closed greenhouse so we can recirculate the air. Uh, we got screens to shorten the day. We got LEDs up there to lengthen the day. So the, and we got, in this case, you can see those wooden poles. We got many sensors up there to simply measure what is happening around the crop to measure light, temperature, uh, humidity in the different layers. And this actually was also meant to simply check if our greenhouse was performing fine. You say basically say uh, last year, I've been living inside this greenhouse to get it up and running. It's a story that is often not told. So if you have such a fancy tool and you switch it on, it doesn't work. And then you need to start testing, fixing, testing, fixing with your suppliers. And then everything is going to get under control. Um, so we're talking about tomatoes. So those plants are growing there. Um, and we are measuring them. So let's first focus on measurements. So plants travel around to get good quality images. So that's the whole reason to ship them around. So actually, we don't like plants to move. Plants also potentially don't like to move. But we said, okay, we need you to go to imaging station because we would like to see how you're actually, how you look like from different, uh, with different images, image modalities. So for instance, we would like to know the shape of the plant. It has also been uh, uh, shared in earlier presentations. Actually, the concept that this big thing, the Maxi Marvin, as we call it, is a, is a self-made creation to create a 3D model of a plant. And I presented this earlier. So um, uh, It's a shape from silhouette, a volumetric intersection idea. You get multiple angles and you reconstruct your plan based on these multiple angles. So in this case, we got 15 cameras all taking a one shot moment in time to speed up. So that's where the high throughput comes in. So it takes only maybe a second to take that picture. So the, the processing is actually the time consuming part, bringing that plan to the imaging station. And if you do this correctly with some calibration, then you can say, I know for each pixel on one of those 15 cameras, how that pixel is linked to our 3D cube. So it's, it's shape carving, you could say. 
And if you do this correctly, we are lifting the plant actually up to be in the center of all those 15 cameras and we can easily recreate actually a, a lookalike of this plant. And another point I'd like to make this is data, but data is not useful for research. So you need to extract information before you can actually do something with it. Although you could say we are a bit like the technology geeks, we already like this, this, this data, but one of our uh, PhD students is working on extracting information from that data. So we're gonna count leaves, we're gonna estimate leaf area, I'm gonna try to get rid of that stick, and then data is changed into information. Um, another thing that's also in the greenhouse is a, a long dark adaptation tunnel or light adaptation tunnel to measure, for instance, uh, you could say uh, measure plants top view, so you can get a picture. And the beauty of this uh, system is actually that it's a very straightforward approach if you would like to get a top view surface area. You can, you can get rid of the pot and the background because you use the fluorescence in the plant to simply filter, but you can also do more. So you can also extract uh, aspects on the plant that are uh, linked to the photosynthesis activity of a specific variety. I'm not gonna zoom into that topic today. What I do like to zoom into is actually this, this concept. So we have six modules that are all generating data. We are having already within the greenhouse around 20 PCs connected to imaging systems that are extracting image from, from those cameras. They are stored locally for a few days. Then we are uploading the data. So we are acquiring the data over here. And then we actually found that if we would hand over this acquired data to our end users, so you could say the, for instance, the Dutch academic research community or industry partners or you, international partners, international initiatives. And often people are not able to deal with that amount of data. So one experiment could be three terabytes or more, and then actually people get stuck. And this is, I think, a major concern for all of our uh, facilities around the world. So therefore we are, as MPEG, which is a service providing facility, you could say, collecting tools that are out there to curate data, to organize data, you could say, but also to help people in some first analysis steps to show that there's information hidden in the data. Um, by, for instance, uh, I'll show you in a minute, but by visualizing it, by exporting CSV files, by providing Python code, uh, just to make sure that people get a hold on what's happening there. But for quite a few plant scientists, these kind of tools are very new. We have been living in this uh, bubble already for, for 15 years, I think. So we store the data with using IROS, so that's really for the image data. And we are implementing FIS from France, INRA, to collect information. Also sensor data, time series data of, of other things, but those are the numbers. So the numbers go into FIS, data goes into IROS. Just to show you an example, also to bring it down to earth. If we talk about metadata, so that's like enriching the raw data, then we are talking about simply JSON files with information, for instance, about the environment. So what's the temperature? Um, what's the light intensity? Uh, another thing, but this is probably outdoor, actually. If you talk about the plots on the field, where specifically is that plot? So where did that data actually come from? On what day, uh, what GPS position, which units, which names? If there was an image session, then uh, when was that image session uh, done? Um, for instance, let me see. The, oh, this is the plot actually, the exact plot coordinates. But then the last one, also crucial, is which type of sensor were you using? to be so for instance lidar in this case but which type was actually being used but then more specifically which number which id is on that sensor if you would replace that sensor halfway your experiment who knows your data suddenly changes a bit uh, things about calibration viewing angle anything that could matter 
in your data analysis process. So we have been running several experiments uh, in the last year. People are not interested in this topic. So they, they don't mind during the experiment. But six months after the experiment, then the questions come in. Then they will say, was it a sunny day when the drone was flying or was it a cloudy day? Or what type of camera were you actually using? I, I don't, uh, I, I wanna know more. And if you don't store it now, information might be lost. Just another example, also from the Digital Twin project. So we first, we collected images. So this is side view pictures of an RGB camera. Uh, you can see the tomato growing over time. Actually, you saw a dip actually in the growth curve there yeah, on uh, day 32. That was the moment and there was a television team in our greenhouse filming the plants and the pump broke down, so a very pleasant day. But just to show you, this is a video that we uh, hand out to our users and also to us ourselves. So we want to see how do the plants look like. So we make time series. We provide Python code, which actually extracted information. So high width, biomass, solidity, not very fancy features, but at least you got some in insights. And we provide CSVs with growth curves. And that's the first step in even more advanced analysis that each researcher themselves needs to do. And then, okay, let's uh, talk about the digital twin idea. So we've got tomatoes growing here. And then to show what a digital twin is, also to talk with tomato growers, but also you researchers, we are visualizing the models. So we have a plant growth model and we have been recreating the greenhouse actually really in 3D to discuss how the model actually looks like. So you could say we have a, a Unity version of our greenhouse where we have actually uploading the models that we have created on the specific pots with the correct distances from each other to really have a, a discussion on the concept of a digital twin. And we continued actually on this level. Now, if we have our greenhouse, we can uh, we have simply imported the 3D drawings from the different suppliers, so from the greenhouse manufacturer, from the conveyor system. And there we have included the grow in based uh, virtual plan models created by uh, my colleagues, Jochem Evers and Katrina Streit. We've got growth curves. And here you can already see that you can verify actually if your plant really looks like the real plant. Or you could go to the RGB imaging and say, do my plants really grow as tall as I expected with my model. Because everything matters actually if you grow plants, if you would change some things in the environment, you would get the different phenotype, okay? That's obvious. But what growers, for instance, do, they remove leaves on purpose. And if you remove leaves, the plants simply get less energy and it will grow differently. Or it would, maybe you would like to trigger the plant to start flowering. That those are not environmental conditions that you can measure. Those are environmental conditions that you can control. So a grower can decide to harvest leaves now or not. Or he can try to trigger his plants to start flowering, so to start producing uh, yield or wait a few days. And especially this thing, this is defining actually, this is determining their uh, income. So those are very, you could say dangerous decisions to make. And if we would be able to help them in simulating what those decisions could mean for them, taking into account weather, taking into account the genotype, we could uh, launch this digital twin as a tool that is useful. So light is essential, right? So if the plant receives light, it will grow. So for instance, what we have been working on, so these are the light interception models. So the models that I show are very focused on light. There is, you can calculate the amount of light that is really hitting the leaf. If you got a dense genotype, the lower leaves will get less light. And then if you get a very open structured uh, genotype, if you would place your plants in a very dense situation, you get a different response if you would place your plants further apart. So also plant density in a commercial greenhouse is a decision a grower can make. So we are able to simulate that and recalculate what those plants would actually receive, take that into account into the model, create again virtual models again, and then we can play around with, for instance, sun, 
LEDs, uh, plant models. Uh, and now the essential part comes in. So we are now closing the loop. So we are now looking at the virtual plant models that are being grown. We are measuring the real tomato plant. We had several genotypes in our greenhouse. And we are exploring which plant model parameters need to be tuned to make them uh, appear like the, those genotypes. So we had a brioso uh, tomato bri uh, phenotype, which looked like this plant, open structured leaves, uh, uh, very uh, clearly visible internode lengths. But we also had, for instance, Moneymaker, a well-known old tomato variety, which is a very dense tomato, which is hiding actually its internodes because it's so, uh, all its leaves are so curled. And the beauty of doing this in simulation is that you could go back in time, change your parameters and run your experiment again. So again, so we are constantly tuning. So here you have this Brioso tomato, a beautifully open structured uh, tomato variety, very popular with growers a few years, a few years ago until some viruses came in and then growers were starting to make different decisions. And then we are trying to mimic the plant. So that's uh, the, the key element, but we're not done yet, right? So this is the real situation. And imagine that you would like to phenotype those plants, right? So there is a, a rock wall block somewhere there and there's a stem growing that stem is basically 10 meters long. There are leaves all over the place, tomatoes all over the place. But if you would like to phenotype here, it's tough. So we decided to go first to moving plants on a conveyor system to collect data and show this proof of principle. So the future work is here. Now well, the digital twin is really to to have an applied end user in view. So we would like to increase use, uh, resource use efficiency. So that's uh, energy, so the gas prices going up, electricity prices are going up, but also space. So the more plants you can actually squeeze into your greenhouse could be efficient, but there's of course a maximum. Uh, water usage is also a, definitely a challenge or other inputs, focusing on greenhouse tomatoes, right? So how are we now uh, progressing? So we would like to offer this decision support to growers, so not to researchers, but really to the tomato growers by providing real-time detailed information. And we can definitely help them to optimize the greenhouse climate control uh, by integrating these models. So that we have been running greenhouse uh, challenges on autonomous greenhouses. And there we are mostly relying on the climate control system. We would look, like to look at the plants actually. And there comes actually what I've mentioned, the pruning strategies. So for a grower, you need to have a pruning strategy. So when are you removing leaves and how are you removing leaves? Uh, but if you are considering to build a new greenhouse, you could also explore different lighting strategies, different greenhouse constructions, different glass types. It all matters. So, so if we can simulate it, we can help them. And in the end, you could say we could create phenotypes. So if we know the model, we can say we can give the plant what it needs to have an open structure or to have a bit of the fruits clearly in view. And then our end goal is for this specific topic is to phenotype really towards fully autonomous greenhouses. Okay. Last but not least, I would like to invite you all to come over to Wageningen. And we are organizing a live event. Just to really explicitly uh, state this, we would like to bring people really together, just like today, but then we're aiming for 300, 400 people. We all there have the official opening of our facility, but all, including also a very scientific program with keynotes, poster presentations, guided tours, also a guided tour to one of those commercial greenhouses further in the west of the Netherlands. Uh, at the moment, we have around 220 people already registered. So it will be a crowded event, but we have even more people waiting to finally decide if they are able or willing or interested to come over. 170, 80 abstracts submitted. So it will be a big event. 
So please, I would say, consider to come over. And I would like to thank actually all my colleagues of which I uh, borrowed work and pictures and materials. If there's, I'm not sure if there's room for questions then let me know. Thank you very much, Rick. Yes. Yeah. Very nice and, and very well illustrated presentation. Open for questions and Henrik. Rick, count me in for September. Ah, good. Um, I, I have a question. The digital twin is still a little bit disparate in the sense that uh, all the facilities you now are setting up are focusing on plants up to one meter. And you already said that in, in the future you would like to tackle these these tomato crops that are five meters tall, or how, how much is it? Uh, yeah, even even worse. Yeah. And even worse. Uh, and as you said, there's a lot of uh, things going on when you go from the individual plants of one meter to the the one that grows basically in a kind of competition uh, with in a, in a much denser canopy, right? Yeah. Um, but I. I I think you are already trying to characterize these larger crops, right? I mean, you. So, what do you think are the steps that are necessary to to really make it into a digital twin? Oh yeah, I was. I think what I like a lot is to discuss with tomato growers because if they look at our, you could say fancy tools, they say yeah, completely useless for me, and they are looking at very specific traits. So we would like to discover which plant traits matter that can be measured by tools in such a situation. So uh, we don't like to shoot with a, with a machine gun and with tools on these kinds of plants. There was, uh, for instance, there was a very specific trait that is always at the top of the plant, really high up, six meters up. That's the width of the stem below the growth point. And that's something like a holy grail. And that's actually where you can measure what the plant is actually doing. There you appear to be able to measure, that's not proven yet, when the plant is deciding to go vegetative or uh, uh, generative. So those, those that's so and basically what, yeah, short and long answer, but we are extracting lots of traits to zoom into the specific trait that can be implemented here, and we are testing that too already. A LIDAR doesn't work sufficiently in this case. No, 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 it depends. But no, it, it needs to be an integrated approach where you have a clear goal. So just running around with a LIDAR is not enough. But LIDAR on a big pole to, for instance, look specifically at that specific stem thickness could work. But those stems, they, they, the plant grows. So it's constantly moving around so that that particular measurement point is next day could be gone, could be 30 centimeters down or up. So the information that you get now at the moment from these one meter tall plants, to what extent are they relevant for this crop? What, what would you estimate? Uh, yeah, yeah. so we, um, we had two stakeholder meetings with tomato growers and suppliers of this industry to sit down, look at the data and talk about the scalability of our experiment. And that's also where those fancy illustrations were meant for, to illustrate the concept and to launch the discussion. Okay, so we are near, what's next? And that ha will happen there. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. All right. There's a question by Carl Otto in the video conference. Carl Otto, please unmute yourself and yes. go ahead. Oh, nice toys you've got, Rick. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing some time. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges when we talk about these huge crops, so the lettuce, so the salad, or the tomato, or cucumber crops, is this, as you said, the size. But also, if you grow it in one hectare of a greenhouse, which is standard minimum size, then you have a huge heterogeneity over, the, well, along the pathways, along the length of the greenhouse. And I'm just wondering how we can cope with that because. Um, it will, uh, the grower is, tomato growers are, let's say a bit conservative uh, and, and they, they look at the worst or the best crop part of the plant and adjust the worst ones to be, be better. So the twin digital twin might be a very good solution, but how do we account for things that doesn't work? 
Sorry, can you repeat that last question? How, how, how do we account for huge heterogeneity within the crop uh, or the, and the, the, the hectare greenhouse? Because when we do it in our small greenhouses or labs, we get perfect, relatively uniform products. The farmers, the growers know there's a large variation within the crop. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So I think the reason why I present this approach is actually to the bridge the gap between the growers and the research domain and to simply launch the discussion on who we need to team up with to approach this from their angle. Right, so solutions have to be found too. So yeah. they are not yet on the table, but you need to develop them together with the growers. That's right. Okay. Now the solutions are on the table, you could say, but I think the um, evaluation of these multiple solutions need to be decided by the end user. So otherwise we will get something like a technology push and it will in the end not work, right? The growers need to embrace this idea. Okay, Carlotto, are you satisfied with the answer? <laughs> we'll continue later. <laughs> All right, thank you. So there is a final question now by Ben, uh, sorry. Okay. Hi, really nice talk. Um, have you looked into also using these facilities to look for other varieties like determinate tomato varieties, which are um, generally are bushy and they grow with multiple main stems. So have you looked into modeling the fields tomato crop maybe and uh, can you use this as well? So, in, 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 um, so you have field tomato crops, right? And they generally have multiple main stems. Have you looked into phenotyping? Because they're also quite bushy. And um, yeah. How... So the, you mean the, the double headed tomato? Uh... Yeah. So tomato for the tomato sauce industry. I'm not called. sure if I added. Yeah. That's, that's... Uh, yes. Yeah. Short answer is yes. Uh, that makes the phenotyping more complicated. And uh, yeah, those are the, the decisions that we need to make. So we have been uh, growing tomato plants with two stems in our greenhouse up till one meter. And then we can still extract information from the, uh, for instance, a 3D reconstruction system. But at a certain moment in time, these stems are completely separate from each other. So in the early stage, it's not a big deal, actually. We are actually running an experiment right now with these double-headed tomato uh, varieties. And there we are looking now specifically at that growth point, stem width up, up high, which is actually, it doesn't exist. The growth point is just a bunch of tiny leaves. Uh, and we are now trying to define what is actually the thing that you need to measure up there in this cluster of small leaves. And that's why we are running another experiment in Agrina to really specifically dive into this trait only with growers. All right. So we have to look yep. at the time a bit. But Ben, do you still have a question? We There's can do it one in break, more from was... Tim in the video we conference. Have time. Um, I mean, we discuss various, or you discuss various challenges now. Yeah, uh, but I'm wondering, in the grand scheme of a digital twin for tomatoes, what what's what do you think would be the biggest challenge? Probably is it is it actually at the level of the model and and parameterizing a model? Is it the level of scalability to a commercial greenhouse? Is it the level of getting the right sensor in such a commercial setting? Uh, I, I wonder where where do you expect to see the biggest hurdle along the way? Or do we know that yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Okay, that's how I like to focus now on that. What I did to see, look at the grower, right? So that has been dealt with. I could say, you could say, the digital twin funding scheme uh, enabled us to team up with people that we have not been working together with earlier. So colleagues that we only saw at the coffee machine, and that's it. So the modelers, um, say on one hand, the sensor. AI guys, on the other hand, what the biggest challenge now is, just to be honest, is that 
everybody keeps doing their highly specialistic things within their bubbles and the bubbles touch. But if we would be able to really close the loop and start tuning the models with the reality, and on the other hand, tuning the reality based on model predictions, then we are really doing something new. Um, and that's not something that we have solved yet, because that's, an, that's the good news for us. That's an unlimited amount of research challenges. Yeah. So there, I think right. we will have a lot of fun in the upcoming years. Okay. okay. So then I would like to allow Tim to ask this question. And that would be the final question for this part. Tim? Hi, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, I guess following from that question, do you think you can really model, do you think the current modeling tools like in, in Unreal Engine or you know, wherever, can you actually model all of the things that are going on, including light and how the plant reacts sufficiently that you could make a digital twin that actually behaves like a real one? Or are there fundamental complexity problems you'll run into when you try and do that at whatever scale you think it needs to be done at? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, probably the answer is no. There are, uh, the models are now based on uh, average plant development. And if something very sudden, appears in the greenhouse, a disease or some, some, something unexpected. The models are not, not taking this into account. And also some very specific elements that are, so um, it's a model, right? So they require some input. And some of the inputs are assumed to be constant, which, which are not constant actually. But the model is now based on temperature and light mainly. Um, and it's assuming that the water is stable and available. So if we put the plants in a, <clears throat> in a different nutrient uh, solution, then the model needs to be adapted to take that into account. So the model is not a full representation of what's happening to the plant. And will we get there? I think we uh, have many ideas to simply enlarge the model and bring it closer to reality. That's actually part of this challenge, closing this loop idea. Yeah. Okay, Tim, is that fine for you? Yeah, thank you. All right, <laughs> thanks. So thank there you. is another question in the chat, but maybe Rick yeah, can do it. I'll do it the chat yeah. so that we can move on. Thank you again. Okay, thank you.